Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of the Addiction Help podcast, where we discuss the latest in news, sports, and entertainment, and anything else going on pretty much as it pertains to the world of addiction, mental health, addiction recovery. I am your host, Dan Hauser, as always, and with me today is the founder and chief executive addict of addiction, not just addiction help, but addictionhelp.com as well, Chris Carberg. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. How are you doing? Great. It's good to be here with you. I always like to talk about this subject and dive in. And, and I, I enjoyed the first the first episode and just what you and Jess were talking about and wanted to wanted to jump in. We send our our well wishes to Jess. I know she's got a migraine she's dealing with. And we're all pretty much open books here, so she probably won't kill me for for letting everyone know that. But yeah, so yeah, yeah. Normally, she was going to be with me today, as Chris mentioned. She was feeling a little under it. We've all been there. We know exactly what that one is like. So Chris was kind enough to, in a pinch, hop on with me for a minute, so we could get all of you our brand new episode for the week and not leave you all hanging. Really quick, before we get into the meat of today's podcast, I would like to take a minute to thank everyone who. Did kind of listen to our pilot podcast, if you want to give it that title, our episode one. Uh, and not just all of you that listened, but all of you that listened and then chose to also reach out and let us know that you listen and share your thoughts with us. Obviously, I had many kind of within my little inner circle who listened and, and shared their thoughts with me on it. But more importantly, I had some people who I didn't really know who they were, <laughs> so to say. And they they shared that they listened and they shared that the impact that it had on them and what, what they felt about it. And that's, that's what we're here to do. So that was really awesome that um, all the feedback that we got uh, from everyone who did listen, uh, Chris, uh, it was pretty cool. One of the things that I got last week was I know when you listened, you, uh, you listened in the car, which was really awesome. You had it up on I your, did. your car play. You sent me a little screenshot of it up there. And, um, you know, you mentioned at one point the feed went out on you and you were like, well, what's going on? And you got really bummed out that you yeah, that it cut yeah. off in the middle of it and you were like, get this back going. So uh, obviously that was really cool, too, because it means that um, that you were really interested in the topics Jess and I were discussing and that uh, you were enjoying what you were listening to. Yeah, no, I want I wanted to have the experience of like, you know, we do this on video, you know, but but it's traditionally it's a podcast, right? Your voice is telling a story. Um and I uh, wanted to see what that experience was going to be like. But yeah, I was, I was uh, driving around the campus listening to the show where I, I live not too far from UCF. And so in the mornings, I tend to drive around there and was listening. And then at some point, my phone disconnected. One of my, I guess my cable's going bad. So I was like, it was like, bloop. And I was like, whoa, 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 what happened? What happened? You know, and so then I started thinking, I'm like, I guess that's the good reaction to have when there's something is like, ah, as opposed to, ah. I tossed a bullet there, you know? Um, and yeah, and so I, I got it all set back up. But yeah, no, it was a lot of fun just listening to you uh, and just talk about those those topics. And as a recovering addict myself, it's important to talk about the things that are happening in the news because what they do is they just kind of open up the floodgates to talk about other stuff go, and allow you to kind of go deeper because everyone's attention is on it for a moment. And so if somebody in professional life talks about recovery, all of a sudden you have that brief moment where you can actually talk about it and everyone is on board with that. I know what we're trying to do here with addictionhealth.com and all and the entire network of shows that we're, we're developing right now, which is to meet people where they are, to find ways to talk about things that, that mean something to people who are battling addiction, um, are, are in recovery or, or people who love someone that's in either one of those camps, which I know there's a lot of you and more, more than likely the people that I'm talking to who I'm even reaching, um, hi mom, uh, are in that camp, you know, that there's tons more people who love someone who is battling addiction or in recovery than there are even, uh, even actually battling addiction. I, and I think the important thing in kind of what we're trying to establish here, and I think we did a, a pretty good job, hopefully of it in the, in the first episode is, um, humanizing addiction, essentially, by being able to tie it to these real world events, you know, it's just another way to destigmatize it as a whole and remind people out there that um, it's okay, I guess, to not be okay, you could say, um, and that yeah. it's, uh, it, it, you're allowed to, we all have problems, and we're all allowed to have those problems. And that, you know, hopefully, it's a reminder that there are, through these examples of people who have also gone ahead and done it, yourself included, there are ways that right. you can go ahead and get the help that you need. So it's not, um, 
I guess, as big of an issue anymore. Obviously, it's, it's something yeah, that will no. never truly go away, but it's something that, that you can um, no, be able to right. enjoy your life, enjoy your life and, and not have it um, over overtake it anymore. Yeah, because I, I mean, that's like talking about Narcan on the last episode. I know one of the things you and I threw back and forth and same with Jess uh, was the fact that, you know, a lot of people hear about Narcan. They, what they what they hear is a get out of jail free card, really. And that's what they sadly don't like. They almost feel like those of us who are who battle addiction, it's kind of like, well, that's your bed. You got to sleep in it, buddy. Um, in reality, it's no, that's your body bag. You got to sleep in it. That's that's what we're talking about here. So when we when we when we need to chill the rhetoric, sometimes it's 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 kind of like understanding that we're not talking about something. Um, we're not talking about a bad day. We're talking about life and death. And and people um, battling addiction have families. They've got kids. They've got you know. And and so you know, to Jess's point, to your point, I think that mentioning you know that Narcan is a, is a it's a pause button in the game. I think going into it. And that was one of the things that really stood out for me in the last episode was was the uh, just it is a pause button and uh, you can't recover if you're dead. Um, and so if you have any chance or hope of someone recovery um, and what happens more times than not is people think that like, I mean, if you if you love someone who's an addict, um, you probably have been disappointed. And that's one of the hard parts about loving someone who's an addict is they disappoint you because one of the reasons, you know, people talk about the phrase, and when I when I got into recovery, they said, you know, um, relapse is a part of recovery, and I, I I did fight that for a long time. I still do to a degree, um, because uh, again, are we suggesting that people should just go relapse? It's like I don't know, it's part of your system. They, I mean, I know as an addict that I I will use any system that is given to me. Um, so you know, words matter. However, what I also learned was that there was a host of times that I had tried to stop before I, before it took, before I got sober. And those were relapses because I stopped for a couple of days. I stopped for a little bit of time. And what we always picture as relapse is the long-term recovery, you know, ending or something along those lines. But I think, again, you know, what we're really talking about here is human, human beings. These are people. We're all people. Um, you can be you can be sober and be uh, a wonderful person. You can also be someone who is in addiction and still be a wonderful person. Someone loves. Uh, you can be sober and and be a total idiot. Uh, you the same thing with you know like I mean that's the thing. It's like we're dealing. These are these are like flawed people. We're all flawed, and and it's just I think the goal of this whole thing is and why we launched this, why we built this site. You know. It, is because it's it's this is life and death stuff. This is not like, this is not a you know, this is not just just like fodder for us to like go on social media and bash somebody. It's like, like this is you don't you don't get another you don't get another take of this, you know. You don't go back to one. It's like no, this is it. So, I I I appreciate that mindset that you know that you bring and and you know Jess is I know deeply committed to, um a compassionate mindset and does compassion mean sometimes, you know, someone's going to take advantage of it? Yeah, it does. Unfortunately, that's life. And so if you want to just stop being compassionate and you don't, you want to stop caring, like good luck to you, but it's better to take a chance on people. Um, and, and uh, I, I think honestly, that's, that's the, the moral of the story is like, it's, this is all about taking a chance on people. Um, um it's not about like, it's not about perfection. It's not. I mean, it's, you know, I've spent more, I've done more work since getting sober in 2005, far more work than I ever realized I would ever have to do to keep progressing in my life, keep growing um, in, in, in emotional, mental, spiritual ways, all sorts of things that I had no idea I was going to ever have to deal with. And, and I, th I think that's going to be kind of the evolution of this this podcast and the other shows that we're developing are like, I want, I, I really want it so that wherever you are in this, in this kind of spectrum of, of, of addiction, um, you know, that, that you're, you're, you're worth, you're, you're worth fighting for and you're worth going back for. Um, we don't leave someone behind and that's, that's not society. Now we leave people behind all the time. Um, 
whether we like it or not. Like we'll do it politically. If we don't like someone who thinks differently than us, like, ah, just let them go. You know, like, no, it's, it's, you have to look at everyone the same. And that means, and that's not easy because some of us can be tough to love when we're in our addiction, really, really difficult to love. So yeah, sorry for the spiel, but yeah. That's, no, no, of course that's, uh, it's, it's all very important thing, very important uh, things to bring up. It's obviously why we're here. It's why we're doing what we're doing. Um, one more quick note on that, just before we get into the, to the meat of today's show. Um, if you're listening to us right now, or I should say watching us uh, on YouTube and you haven't already, uh, if you want to take a moment and subscribe to the feed here or wherever you're listening to us right now on whatever uh, podcast medium you're listening to, if you go ahead and uh, hit that subscribe button, we're on Apple, uh, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Amazon, wherever, pretty much anywhere uh, you can get your podcasts. Uh, hit that subscribe button uh, and come take this journey with us as we continue to um, not just continue with this show, uh, but with, uh, like Chris mentioned, the, uh, the entire Addiction Help Podcast Network. We have some really, really exciting things on the horizon here over these next couple months and, and even further out. And so um, we look forward to going on this journey with all of you listeners who are out there follow along with us. And we very much appreciate uh, all your support up to this point and your continued um continued listening. So on that note, let's uh, jump into the meat of today's podcast. Uh, we are in the month of April. Spoiler alert for anyone who might not have known that. Uh, we are in the month of April. Uh, the month of April in the addiction world is actually a pretty big month as it is Alcohol Awareness Month. So uh, mm -hmm. it is a great time of year. Not that every day isn't a great time of year to, to kind of remind people about the dangers of alcohol, but uh, in the month of April, especially, you may notice... Um, a lot more campaigns taking place uh, to kind of spread the word of the potential dangers of alcohol that are out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, to be honest with you, you know, I don't know, I don't know what it means to other people. Um, but to me, you know, it's, it's kind of like, I, I don't even think about some of these months sometimes like, man, I, like they, they apply to me. Um, so like mental health awareness month, it applies to me, but I, I don't always think of, I'm like, all right, are we, are we going to throw a party or something? Like, I don't know what this, I don't know what we're aiming to do. And I think that's part of the issue in here is like, you know, what are we trying to get across here about, about, you know, in this case, alcohol use disorder, uh, you know, about, you know, what, what actually happens, you know, in our lives, um, in the people we love when they drink alcohol. It, that that it's a there's a host of issues that are are like uh, that are that are raised uh, from from that kind of behavior and it's just it, it can be really confusing sometimes when you are thinking through these things and it's like I want to get something done usually with um, whenever there's an opportunity to talk about something it's like what can we really you know what can we really get out of um, out of you know out of this whole concept of using this month and and I think. You know, some of it is diving into, you know, what, what is alcohol abuse? What is alcohol use disorder? I think that the biggest thing we can do, honestly, is that we can identify for others that, that this is a real thing and that, um, that, you know, they may have a problem and they may not realize it. Now, not everyone is, is in kind of a full blown addiction, um, but you might be on the dangerous side of things and you may not realize it, you know, so it's. What is what does alcohol awareness month mean to to you, Dan? Like so when you hear it, um, you know, what does it mean? What does it actually yeah. mean to you versus so, what you might, you know? Yeah, so I, I'm right there with you. I think that it's great that we're kind of taking this month of April to remind everyone of the dangers of alcohol and alcohol abuse and alcohol awareness and, and addiction and all that. But at the same time, okay, great. Well, when May first rolls around, it doesn't mean that the issues that people are currently having with alcohol just magically disappear. Uh, it doesn't no. mean that um, the issues as a whole with alcohol and the dangers behind alcohol just m magically disappear on May 1st. So yeah, it's, it's great that maybe that this month is, is shining a light, an additional light and maybe bringing it back to the forefront of those who might not think about it on a daily basis, but mm -hmm. for people like us and in, in the field we're in, okay, great. It's just, another day of the week for us because every day is, mm -hmm. is a day to remind people of alcohol abuse, alcohol addiction, the dangers behind that, the differences behind it, um, 
ways you can get help if you are battling um, alcohol abuse and addiction. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's um, I, I think you put it well. Usually in these situations, it's okay. What's the end game here? Where what's the mm -hmm. goal of this? What's the purpose of this? And um, short of maybe some additional ad campaigns taking place, I don't really know if it's anything that makes April different than any other month of the year that that uh, people are drinking during, mm -hmm. which is basically every single day and month of the year. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And I, I think, you know, um, and alcohol, I, I think alcohol is one of those that kind of skates by, um, you know, we all know that, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm going to be a kind of a judged addict if I use something else, but alcohol has that effect where, you know, it can be, it, it can make you feel, um, I mean, there's, I mean, most of our advertisements, our sponsors are, um, they're, you know, it's, it's going to be not our sponsors. I should make, make it clear. Um, <laughs> societal sponsors, um, societal sponsors are like, you know, it, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, you know, your, your, your beer and what are companies essentially funding a vast majority of media out there. They, they're sponsoring our sports. They're sponsoring, um, our events, they're sponsoring everything from, you know, from Christmas to 4th of July to Halloween. All of it is practically subsidized by alcohol manufacturing companies. And so it can be difficult growing up. Like, I mean, our kids are going to grow up in a house where there's no alcohol in it. Um, now, I have, and again, I, I still don't understand this, but I have met some people um, and from now, every now and then who I have witnessed have a drink of alcohol, like a beer or something. And what they do apparently is they, they drink it over a long, long period of time. And sometimes they even leave some in their glasses. So to those of us who are addicts who are listening to this, this is like, what? Like, <laughs> I'd never heard of such a thing. Like you leave something in your glass. Like I, I want to go over and finish it for them. Like I feel bad. Um, but that's the thing is it's, you know, you're, you're there. It, it's not, you know, for our kids, like for instance, it's, um, I knew growing up that there was a risk of it with, with that having grown up with, with a dad who was an alcoholic and, and in recovery. And, um, and it's, it's going to be something we talk about early, but for, for, for those of us who, who are really trying to utilize this time, I think the biggest thing we can do is is to make an impact on getting people out of high risk situations when they're using alcohol. And, and the first thing I always kind of go to is it, it goes back to driving cars. Um, it's, it's, we've heard about, you know, drunk driving and, you know, or we've heard about uh, these, these things for, uh, you know, long enough that we think we've, we've got them figured out, but no, I mean, there, there's still plenty of people doing it and, it is the number one thing that's going to put someone at risk, uh, you know, both themselves and others. And then, so, you know, so I, I, I always try to think of, a, you know, like for, you know, can we, can we get focused on that and make that a very clear, clear thing to maybe looking out for others who maybe, maybe we have a loved one who drink and listen, I'm just saying, if we can get keys out of people's hands, uh, it can save lives. And then the next thing, is you know the the one of the greatest challenges i think that come with alcohol you know use and abuse is is what happens to our families it creates erratic relationships it ter it turns relationships that are normally really really you know wonderful into like hellscapes um and i you know i dan i, I don't know just i'm i'm interested and you can feel free to cut this part out, but I'm interested to know, like, you know, and what have you, have you been around somebody who's dealt with anything like this before, you know, like what, what is it like if, if maybe uh, of what you've experienced in the past with, you know, with people who battle with alcohol, you know, alcohol abuse? Yeah. So, um, I, I have not personally dealt with, um, alcohol abuse or addiction for, as far as myself, that being said, I mean, the the interesting thing about it is that you don't have to 
necessarily even be addicted to alcohol to know that alcohol is just not something that is good for you or your system. Um, you know, you, you see it, you see it a lot of, of times in terms of, you know, you might be out at a, whether it's a friend of yours or somebody that's just out there and you happen to be at the same place, you know, the, the, the concept of bar fights or people drinking and getting angry or drinking and their mood changing. That's not just a happy coincidence. You know, people sometimes joke, Oh, you know, well, if I drink the brown stuff, you know, oh, I'll start fight, wanting to start wanting to fight somebody. Well, okay, I mean, we can joke about it to an extent, and we can laugh it off and say, "Ha ha!" But what that is is that's your body and your brain saying to you, "We don't like what you're giving us, and this is now what's mm-hmm. happening." So you don't even necessarily have to have an alcohol addiction to find yourself in a situation where alcohol can be a bad thing for you or put you in a in a potentially harmful situation. Um, and you, yeah, you mentioned, no, I, you I mentioned drinking and driving. I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, is and people might not want to necessarily hear this. Um, right now, today, alcohol is the fourth leading cause of pre- preventable death in the United States behind uh, tobacco and poor diet and exercise, essentially. So you think about all the all the, the talk about tobacco and nicotine products and how, you know, live a healthy lifestyle and get proper exercise and dieting and whatnot. Well, <laughs> Conversations need to be had about alcohol in those same lights, too, because whether it's drinking and driving or alcohol poisoning or yeah. there, there's so many things that are, could be considered alcohol related that can lead to ER visits, death, um, personal destruction as far as relationships, if you talk, as you've talked about. Um, it It's a slippery slope, and there's a it very, is. very, very fine line between being okay and not okay when it comes to drinking. And um, I think that for a lot of people, that line is still tough to navigate, whether, whether they are an alcohol or whether they are battling an alcohol addiction or not there, that, that line is still a very, still a tough line to be able to navigate. And even, mm-hmm. even in the simplest of terms. Yeah. And, and just kind of like going off of, um, you know, just a, the fact sheet from, from, uh, from mad and from uh, mothers against drunk driving. Um, you know, it, it is, uh, there's some, there's some pretty, pretty serious stats. And, um, the reason, you know, I bring these up are, are not to necessarily shock us into, to doing something, but like, you know, understand how, how fast this thing gets out of control. Um, so every 45 minutes, someone is killed in a drunk driving crash. Um, every 90 seconds, someone is injured in a drunk driving crash. Two out of three people will be impacted by drunk driving in their lifetime. Um, the average drunk driver drives over 80 times before the first arrest. So, you know, um, and I think if you've, if you've done it, and I, I, I don't have memory of doing it from when I, when I was in my active addiction, but uh, I'm sure I did. And I don't know the number of times. But I'm going to tell you, it's it's it is a um, it's a serious thing, and and we have we have never had more opportunities to prevent issues. Um, I mean, we want to talk about like, I, I, you know, maybe maybe it's maybe I'm dating myself. That's always sounds weird when people say they're dating themselves. I know what they're saying; it makes you sound older, but um, but it also sounds like maybe you want to take yourself out to dinner. But anyway, I digress. Um, what I, what I kind of noticed was, um, you know, back in, back in the old days, it was like, you had to go get a taxi, right? And you had to, you had to find a taxi and then you've got to find a way to get back to where you were, if you were going to do that, or you have to get a designated driver, a friend home. And, um, you know, with, with some of the ride sharing app, like, and, you know, like Uber and Lyft, I mean, like, there's never been more of an incentive to, to be able to do that and do it safely and then easily be taken back to where your car was the next day. Um, now, listen, I'm certainly not an advocate for, for alcohol use because of my own history with it, but I, I want to be, I want to live in reality and that I know that, that I'm talking to someone like myself, maybe who has not had that awakening yet. And um, I would rather they survive and have a chance at life than, than the alternative. Um, so, I mean, like we, we've got plenty of options though. Um, we have, we have apps, you know, we have friends, we, we can literally, you know, we can, we can 
we can get home without having to do having to to drive and i imagine that you know we're going to get closer and closer um you know um it's it, it, closer and closer to some kind of technology i think that will will disable vehicles i mean there will there'll be a host of things i imagine that will will continue to come you know um it'll but it'll only be on newer ones i imagine um you you and, mentioned you know, but real again, quick yeah no, sorry real quick you mentioned it it just it kind of sparked a memory in my mind you mentioned about uh, the old days of, of of needing a cab and whatnot i remember uh, i remember back when i was in college going back to the beginning of the show at ucf as you were driving around that campus the other day <laughs> Uh, and I, I remember this was go obviously, nights. yeah, go uh, this was obviously way, way before, um, you know, the smartphone technology that we have now with, uh, the ability to have those ride sharing apps have easy access on your phone. And I remember basically keeping a 20 shoved in the back of my wallet, um, just mm -hmm. in case I ever found myself in a, in a spot on a night where I needed to get a cab home because back then also it's not like now too, where. You pay through everything through the app too, and it's linked up to your credit card or your debit card. Like you actually had to pay for those cabs in cash, so you had to also yeah. have cash on you on top of the ability to figure out how to get one. You know, once you got one, then you had to right. pay cash. <laughs> so I remember having that yeah, twenty no, shoved absolutely. in the back of my wallet, uh, so I could then pay for the cab uh, if if I found myself in a situation where I needed to get one home. So yeah, no, it's um, we've yeah. definitely come a long way in the ease in which we can now get uh, safe rides to wherever we need to go. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, like we can, you know, I just think it's really important to consider, you know, that, um, and, and, you know, that what we're dealing with here, again, is we're talking about alcohol um, and alcohol, you know, alcohol addiction uh, issues, um, you know, but I think one of the other problems are that, you know, we're, we are surrounded by messaging that tells us that if you want to have fun if you want to be somebody if you want to matter in life have a drink and like i i you know i, I get it I, I know exactly trust me i know firsthand what it's like when somebody you know when you start thinking you're not going to be able to carry this prop that you carry around in a party you know like it's you know when you know that you're you know you're not going to be able you're not going to have that quote liquid courage thing um but it's challenging and I don't know that society at large has done anything to really blunt the impact of it, you know, because it's kind of like you're still, I don't think, you know, I don't think, I could be wrong, but I don't think colleges have changed that dramatically. If anything, I think the, the you know, the the access to different types of alcohol has, has only widened. I think people are more educated even about things than, than where they were before. It, it's like... So things have things have not gone in the right direction um with with regard to you know to alcohol and and I, I just think you know with when we look at something like this month and we say, you know what what is the key to to alcohol um awareness month? <clears throat> I think it's honestly this one basic thing, which is alcohol can be the most serious problem in your entire life. And I, I don't think most people view alcohol in that through that lens. I think mo more times than not, it is like, you know, they view it as it's, it's a necessary evil. It's a necessity. It's something I will learn to balance. Um, there is no real option for sobriety. However, in the past five, 10 years, we've started to see a change with the rise of sober bars, with the rise of non-alcoholic drinks, with manufacturers i mean listen this is say what you will about capitalism but um this is the free market kind of realizing that like hey there's something there and we better make some better freaking products or we're not going to sell anything and that's what i feel is happening is like what we see is you know we have people who are who are and again i don't know the science behind all this stuff when it comes to like how they do it okay all I'm saying is they they make it taste like what people like it want it to taste like. They make it appear in the form or fashion that they're going to. I don't I don't personally do it just because I, to be honest, I didn't like the taste of alcohol. Um, you know, like I wasn't one of I wasn't one who who was like that into alcohol. I used it as a tool. Um, 
to, you know, with other things to, to, to call back to your previous to example, to call back to your previous example, yeah. you weren't the one who was just sipping it throughout the night and maybe leaving a little bit at the bottom. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No, it was, it was like, uh, you know, it was, you know, it was wine in a, in a sports jug, like, you know, like just drinking it out of a thermos, you know, for me. And, um, so I'm not your classiest alcoholic, I guess. <laughs> um, if we're judging, you know, but then again, I, I also had a, had a, a gas station hot dog for lunch. So I, that, that also, <laughs> I think you might, yeah, there's a connection between those two. Um, somewhere will go, I, I, I well, thought you, you were going to say it was just as bad. I thought you were going to say it was, uh, you had a fake hot dog for lunch, going back to talking about the fake alcohol. They make the fake food now too. I, the, the, I know. The I need, stuff. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I need a, a faux dog. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, Someone out there is going like, you know that hot dog's worse for you than alcohol. And I'm like, okay, you know what, though? I'm not going to I'm not going to go yell. I'm not going to go yell at my, my beloved children because of the hot dog. I may smell and, and emit odors, but I'm just going to say it's, it may make me a slightly less good dad because I'm filled with, filled to the brim with, with, with salt and, what appears to, I, I don't even know what a hot dog is. To be nitrates honest. and whatever else happens to be in it. Yeah. Nitrates and yeah. But I mean, like, that's the thing. I, I think that, you know, we're, we're dealing with something here though. It's an uphill battle and, you know, our, our sports, our sports push it. Our, um, I, the reason I don't like going to live sports, uh, are mostly because of the fights, like mostly because of the violent kind of potential for things to get out of hand. And, um, now it's like, oh, hey, guess what? You know how much you love having people drunk at games? Well, we added something. We made it easier for them to bet on things and worry about losing money. So it's like, so we, we, we just took like people that were already in a bad mood, a bad attitude. We we're going to get in fist fights and we're like, oh, we, we put their, their mortgage on the table. Um, so it's like, oh, I'm sure that's only going to improve the, the quality of the experience for everyone, you know? Um, you know, it's just, I don't know. Like, it's just, I, I think that's what we're, we're dealing with. It's something it's, it's very challenging, um, that people are just not, they don't, you know, they don't consider alcohol a drug in a lot of cases. And, uh, I do understand that not everyone does what I did with alcohol or does what other people did with alcohol, but I'm going to tell you, if you do even a little bit, I'm just saying it, it, it it's not worth that life it's not worth waking up and people asking you did you really mean what you said you know and you're like oh like or someone tells you like hey i've got a voicemail uh hey i got your voicemail and they play it for you and you have no memory of this and you're like just they think you were being funny they don't you know they don't realizing that you have no memory of it and so I think we're, 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 you know, like awareness of, of alcohol. Um, the biggest thing is that it's, it's a serious, it's a serious thing. And, and more, fa I think more families have probably been broken up uh, and harmed by alcohol in this country than any other single drug, um, uh, you know, uh, barring certain, certain, er you know, eras where there was a, a rush of a certain drug into, to, such as when, when, when crack cocaine hit the streets. Um, and we've had, of course, the opioid epidemic, but I think over, to, oh, by and large, alcohol is a consist has been a consistent, you know, pain in the butt for the entire country. Um, well, and, and it's I, like, we, we do need to be aware of it. I think a big, a big scenario, situation, or not situation, a, a big area where alcohol separates itself from those other two, substances you just mentioned was, you know, opioids, you know, you can get them on the street or you get them with a doctor's prescription, but you need a doctor's prescription to be able to obtain them originally. Crack cocaine, you know, mm -hmm. it's an illicit substance. You kind of have to go out of your way to find it. Uh, y yes, I know it's depending on where you live, it might yeah, be easier yeah. to reveal, but with alcohol, if you're 21, you literally can, you don't, you can, I know, you don't yeah. even have to go a block to find somewhere where you can buy a beer or liquor stores or, you know, here in Florida, you know, to get liquor, we have to go to a separate store than the grocery store. In many states, you can go and buy a 
box of cereal from your local grocery store and get a bottle of vodka to go with, you know, not to go with it, but mm-hmm. in the next aisle over. So, you know, the, the ease yeah. of accessibility for alcohol, I think, makes it a whole different animal, you could say, compared to some of these other uh, harmful substances, just because it is so easy to obtain uh, and so easily available. And it's pretty much everywhere. It is. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, it's a depressant, right? So, yeah. But it, it's it's the only, you know, my wife doesn't drink and she never drank. And one of the questions she asked me early on that I thought was really interesting was like, if alcohol makes you sleepy, why do you drink it before you go out? And I was like, well, obviously, and I was like, I'm thinking, I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's just that the adrenaline hits, right? And you're feeling excited and and it you know that's the other thing i mean like a lot of times we we know that those of us that are in recovery listen the hunt the hunt in the addiction is is almost as rewarding as the actual get of it you know and so you get excited there's excitement there's people that are cheering you on things like that um but it's kind of like at the end of the night eventually alcohol if you if you drink too much of it like it, it always catches up. It always wins. Um, you cannot beat it down, the, you know, in, in a night. If you're drinking all night, eventually you will fall asleep from it. Like you will, like it's going to happen. Just get ready for it. You know, like it's, it's not in by no means is it going to turn into like, um, and that's why people end up using other drugs with it, right? It, it, the other drugs can augment that, can help people to stay awake. They, you know, it's like, you know, if only I had something, you know. To, to, they could lift me out of this state. Um, and I, again, I, I just think it's, it's, it's very challenging to, to combat this when you can get it anywhere when it's, um, and I'm also, listen, I'm not like, uh, like saying that we need to, you know, lock everyone's like alcohol in a, in a, uh, you know, Fort Knox that they, that the government can give to them. Like, I don't know if I trust the government that well either, by the way, it's, it's, what I mean is it's just, that's, that is where we have to, you know, we talk about why awareness, why awareness, because awareness is, awareness is going to be the first thing that gives us some kind of signal that there's a real issue at play here. And that is going to do more than, you know, like I, I think than any just single movement we've tried prohibition. Like we all know what happened. Like, it's like, we, we've, we've all seen the movies. We know. What, you know, we know the rise of, of organized crime. Um, and and like, like, that's the thing. It's like people are going to still find a way to do what they want. But it's, I think that's where, you know, when I'm with my kids and I'm teaching them about something, I'm not scared of them going someplace and hearing, like, I, I imagine they're going to encounter a friend whose parents may drink and they may have a drink around my kid. I, I imagine it will happen. I'm I'm not hopeful of that. I'm not like wishing it, but I'm like, I do think I could picture it happening. And do I think for all of a sudden they're going to abandon what I've taught them over time uh, because they met some cool dad, you know, who, who, who has a drink you like while at the bowling alley when they're, when they're there, it's like, no, it's like, it's like, I'm telling them you got to, and that, you know, in, in recovery, we say play the tape all the way through. And what it means is, you know, don't just play your best hits, you know, like a lot of times why people fall back off and fall off, you know, the proverbial wagon is because you start to remember your drug and you start to remember, oh, it wasn't always bad. You know, there was this, like, keep playing it, buddy. Keep playing, <laughs> you know, like you got, it's like, uh, you know, if you play The Godfather at certain points, it's like, Michael's just a nice, Michael Corleone's just a very nice, lovely, lovely kid. You know, like he, he's in the military, he's a hero, and he has a lovely girlfriend. I'm sure they're going to have wonderful children, and, and, and I'm sure that, I'm sure she's going to be very happy to, to, to have his children. Um, like, keep playing it, buddy. Like, keep playing it, and you will see where we go with this. And that's the same thing that happens, you know. I'm not, but I'm not concerned. I mean, like the Titanic you know, was a, I, was a lovely ship in the beginning, right? <laughs> absolutely. It's, it was a feel good movie about, about shipbuilding. Like <laughs> until it until wasn't, until it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. It's completely true. 
Yeah. It's, Everything was going great until yeah. that iceberg hit. And that iceberg can, can, you can use that as, as, you know, proverbial uh, sense for a lot of things in life. Everything's going great until that metaphorical iceberg hits. And then, uh, it's true. Not so much anymore. Although you want to know, um, one of my favorite things that I, I've, I've told a lot of people is, you know, the, the Titanic could have survived the uh, collision. And, and I think there's a learning lesson in there somewhere, which was they saw the iceberg too late. You know, there's a host of reasons, but um, they saw the iceberg too late and they tried to turn. And when they turned, is th that's what actually ended up gashing too many of the watertight compartments. And if they had rammed it, they would have survived. If they had just so so, listen, like let that be also your your moment of zen for the day of like <laughs> maybe sometimes you have to deal with your problem head on. You can't run from it, and if running from it may we may only just make things worse. So it's kind of like when you get the opportunity to like deal with something. I don't know. Maybe you should just ram it, like Jack Dawson Rose. They be they yeah. be in New York right now. Well, now they'd be old and dead, but it's been eighty four <laughs> years. Uh, now it's been like nine over a hundred years. Yeah. But yeah. you know, they they be there living it living it up, and and uh, Billy Zane would be okay. I'm just saying, there's a lot that could have happened. And that that I think is the perfect transition uh, to talk about your problems head on, because as you guys know from episode one here on the addiction help podcast we do like to kind of well we t we like to talk about this stuff in a real world sense and and apply it to things that are going on uh in the world today and um as we talk as as chris just mentioned uh tackling your problems head on um sacramento kings congratulations to them first off uh making the playoffs for the first time in well over a decade in the nba they're actually get home court advantage uh in this first round of playoffs as well so Obviously, anyone in listening in the Sacramento area, congrats to you because you guys have been through it uh, mm -hmm. this last decade or so. But um, Kyle Draper, who is their uh, local television play-by-play -play announcer for the Kings, um, as part of kind of all this attention the Kings have been getting lately, uh, the sports website Awful Announcing uh, and the writer Michael Grant actually did a little bit of a profile on Kevin Kyle Draper and the Kings' uh, success mm -hmm. this year. And um, one of the topics they, t they discussed was uh, – Kyle Draper's sobriety. Uh, he has actually celebrated this uh, a couple weeks ago, six years of sobriety. Uh, he did battle or, and struggle awesome. with, with alcohol and alcohol addiction uh, as to tie back to what we were talking about with Alcohol Awareness Month. And um, reading the article, a couple, a couple things caught my eye, Chris, that I'd love to read to, each, read to you and get your, your thoughts on, obviously, with your very unique yeah. perspective you have. Um, one of the things that, you know, right out of the gate, he was just asked about, you know, talking a little bit more about uh, his sobriety and about the time uh, he spent dealing with his alcohol problem. And uh, he brought up a really good point. I'll, I'll pull a quote here from the article. He said, I never thought I was an alcoholic until I stopped drinking. I realized how much alcohol impacted my life, who I hung out with and who I was friends with. I had social anxiety. When I'm at a bar or a party, I feel like all the eyes are on me. I always felt like I needed a drink in my hand, so I would drink a lot. I was only a social drinker. I rarely drank at home. <laughs> Uh, an, another, I, another one he, he talked is, about. He, wow. Yeah. Another way he talked about, so he, he described himself and we, we, we touched on this a little bit about alcohol and, and the, the kind of stereotype of somebody who's an alcoholic is someone who is stumbling all over themselves. They can't do anything. Mm -hmm. They're, they're at home all day. They can't hold down a job. They can't you know, essentially be a functioning member of society. It's, it's really, really obvious that they're, you know, an alcoholic and they're, is something out there and there are people out there that are quote unquote functioning alcoholics. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Kyle described himself as one. And when he was asked to kind of expand on that, what he said was that means you're not doing things that will destroy your life. You're still dependable. I was still at work. I was still on TV. I was still doing everything that was expected of me, but I'll tell you this. When I stopped drinking alcohol, that's when my career took off. I was offered a job with the Oklahoma city thunder to be their play by play announcer. I ultimately didn't take that job, but things just started to fall into place for me professionally so there's somebody mm -hmm. who because of you know the line of work he was in because of you know you could say his his uh fame whether it be just locally or nationally or internationally uh he found that he felt more comfortable he had a drink in his hand and he never really thought about it until he stopped drinking and it was at that point when it was kind of the light bulb flash in his head and he said wow um i had a bigger problem than i thought i did and and mm -hmm. so um 
you know, Chris, just kind of some of your thoughts on on that as far as somebody who who was able to come to that realization and, and have that moment of clarity to, to be able to acknowledge that. Yeah, it reminds me of like, we've all grown up in, in our homes where we go over to someone else's house and their house has a smell. And you're like, the heck is that smell? Like they have this weird smell. The people who live there don't smell it because they've gotten used to it. It has become part of their life. It's become part of their system. And the same thing happens with what, you know, with what Kyle was describing. And seriously, like that, that is a big deal. And, and I think when we talk about like, you know, using, um, uh, let's better say utilizing what, you know, what's your opportunity with, with sobriety to change, to, to reach people, this, this kind of stuff does matter. And first off, again, people are not the picture we have of like, of, of the stumbling, bumbling drunk is not necessarily the um the one that, that is the, the the most accurate and i for me you know alcohol abuse that turns into alcohol addiction is one where you know it is part of your persona and without it you don't exist in a way and functional uh you know functioning or high functioning alcoholics you know it First off, I, I have I have also met plenty of high functioning alcoholics, and I have been one. I've done, I you know I remember I had I was well, I was you know a high functioning addict, but like you're high functioning to you number one. You're not high functioning to everyone else. A lot of times, like people are like, you know, like you know you just. I remember one time people were like, you "Trip a lot. Why do you trip so much?" Like, oh, you're like, oh, I remember thinking, I'm like, I've this under control. Like, why does, it, why does Chris trip it on every little carpet like that he sees? It's, it's because like, you know, high functioning is, is kind of a perception thing. Um, and now listen, don't get me wrong. You can still do your job. Um, but, it, but, it, 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 you know, where alcohol, alcohol changes your, your mood, right? It's a, it's mood altering. And when it changes you into some, something that is a, a, a different version of yourself when that be, when that overtakes your original your original persona there's a real problem and you know i do think though that that one of the things he said that i thought was really interesting is you're not doing things that'll destroy your life and that is usually the crossover point at which someone will accept that they have an addiction when they're like you know, there, there would be things that I would be willing to do for a pill that I'm not proud of in my head. I'm like, that I would be willing to, if I, I would, I would give up my family to get a pill in that mindset. Like, no, I, I think later on I'll win them back. You know, I'll, I'll figure, we'll figure that out later. Right. But in that mindset, you're, you're not really in that self-destructed uh, kind of point of view. And so that is one of the reasons why alcohol and alcoholism as a concept is so dangerous because you're not in this place where everything is on fire entirely. The, the downside to a depressant like alcohol is again, you know, it's slowing things down, right? Um, it's, it is slowing things down. Whereas like other certain other drugs, they, they speed things up, right? So you look at mess, you look at, you know, and crystal meth, you look at cocaine, you look at crack, you look at any of those, what are we seeing? Speed up. So what, like, in my opinion, a lot of times, erratic behavior that's more visible. Alcohol diminishes. It, it covers things. It can be kind of like a, a blanket over something. And that might, and so a lot of times you can kind of, kind of sneak through. But everything he's saying, I think probably can ring true to a lot of people who, who battled um, alcohol, alcohol use disorder. We're not going to go through the entire article. Obviously, I, I highly recommend uh, checking it out. It's yeah, a yeah. great piece, even if you're not a sports fan. But one more thing I would like to touch we'll on. The that, link. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, we, I will. For those of you watching, uh, you'll see the link pop up here uh, momentarily where you can find the article. For those of you um, who are listening in a podcast, uh, awfulannouncing.com, uh, you'll be able to go ahead uh, onto their website and find the article and be able to mm -hmm. read it in full there. Uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on, because we, we briefly did speak about this um, a few minutes ago about 
that the 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 idea of uh, the mocktail and the non-alcoholic beers and the being able to have uh, non-alcoholic drinks that might give off the appearance that you're drinking so people don't ask you questions or you feel comfortable being in social settings. And so obviously, given his profession and what he does for a living, he finds himself in situations where he's in social gatherings, he's at bars, he's at restaurants, he's at outings where he has to be front and center as part of his job. Um, and he was kind of asked a, a little bit about um, what he did to kind of fit in in these environments and these situations now that he's sober and mm -hmm. how, you know, it, it might have been a challenge to his recovery. And he spoke of, of a situation in particular here, and I'll read a quick little excerpt from this. And he said the breakthrough for him came when he was in London in 2017. He said, I was doing a meet and greet with Boston Celtics fans at a bar. I went early and I talked to the bartender. I said, what do people who don't drink do at a bar? He said, they order mocktails or order a non-alcoholic beer. So I said, let me try a non-alcoholic beer. I've never been a beer drinker, but when I had that non-alcoholic beer in my hand, because it looked like alcohol, it put me at ease. I wasn't as anxious. I wasn't as worried that everyone was looking at me. Ever since then, when I go out to a bar or restaurant, I'll order a mocktail. So it's, it kind of touches back to what you were talking about a little earlier, Chris, where, where you know, whether we agree with or not capitalistic society or whatnot, uh, there's something there. Yeah. And at the end of the day, if it's something that those who are in recovery can do to make them feel more comfortable when they do find themselves in, in situations where they might be around others who are drinking or they're out to dinner or at a bar or restaurant with a group of people and they don't really want to have to explain maybe why mm -hmm. they're not ordering a drink that night. They can order something that looks and tastes like it's a real drink and to the untrained yeah. eye. It's a drink to, to anyone else looking around at them and they can kind of go about their night and uh, feel a little more comfortable being in an environment where they might not feel fully comfortable because it might bring back some old memories for them or, or be in a situation yeah. where where um, the potential for triggers could or could arise. Yeah, no, my dad, when I when I got sober, I remember one of the first things he told me were <clears throat> he, he, he said, cranberry and club soda. That's your drink. He's like. He's like, if you're out and people are ordering drinks after dinner, order in front of them coffee black. He said, there's something about ordering black coffee because I don't care what anyone says. And maybe uh, it's, I think it's, it's very uncomfortable to drink just straight black coffee. He's like, there's something about ordering black coffee in front of people that has a similar like vibe to being like, I want a shot of this. And it's kind of people are like, oh, you know, like, so those are the two things he gave me. And it's, and you're, but you're exactly right. Like what we're seeing right now, um, trends, um, you know, tr one of the, one of the trends newsletter from the hustle had put out, um, a recent kind of bit of information for kind of a sober curious movement that we're seeing. Um, and this is not like juice. This is alternatives to alcohol. Monthly U S searches for mocktails, um, in January 2016, were under 10,000 U.S. Um, searches uh, on Google, and as of January 2022 or, or February 2022, we're we're inching closer to 40,000. So 4x searches for non-alcoholic beverages, and it's expected to be about a 10 billion dollar industry. Um, so that's that's um, there are sick you know right now there are. Um, we're looking at 6,500 U.S. searches per month for mocktails on Amazon alone. Up, that's up 48% month over month, or 38% uh, month over month. And TikTok, this one TikTok on there that it mentions has 10 million views for mocktail recipes. Um, and it, you know, it just hit its all-time highest Google search volume. And then there's also kits and subscription programs out there. Um, My Drink Bomb is one of them gets about 4,000 site visits per month, all organic. So those are people, again, you know, we, we could talk about like where we want something to go. Um, but, but the market in some ways is going to delineate where people are actually comfortable going. And so what we're seeing is like most things, if you can make change palatable, if you can make breaking a habit, uh, palatable, people are more apt to do it, right? People are more likely to do something when the change is positive for them. And that's, that's again, that's what we're seeing here. More people drove uh, electric, 
cars when you made better electric cars and you made them cooler and you found a way to do it. Like there's, it, it's just a good, it's just basic, like, you know, make better products, get them competing with one another. Unfortunately, in some cases, I'm sure we will see the large alcohol companies will, will go buy out all these things and uh, try to swing them back over. They'll be okay with their, their little piece of it for a little while. But what we are seeing is, and what, what Kyle um, describes, I think is this is a, this is a, you know, a lot of people in recovery know this because listen, when I started going to meetings and, and started, when I got sober, one thing I noticed was everyone started smoking. I was like, I didn't start smoking. Okay. Cause I told my mom when I was young, I said, I'm not going to ever smoke a cigarette. Okay. Not going to happen because my dad smoked. And, but I watched everyone else go pick up cigarettes. And I realized a lot of this has to do with prop behavior. It has to do with like the comfort of a prop. If I sit on a couch, my prop is usually a pillow. I like a pillow in my lap. Okay. It's like, it's my way of like doing a, a socially acceptable weighted blanket, weighted blanket anywhere I go. And so I, but what I think he's tying into is, you know, being able to bring something with you that makes you comfortable and allows you, sometimes it's literally just standing there holding that. And you, you are able then behaviorally to tell your brain that you're doing the exact same thing. It really didn't care about the, like I said, the, the alcohol was incidental. In some cases, of course, when it's dependence related, it's, it, it is obviously like a serious thing, but our, but our behavior that oftentimes triggers us to use, it, it has more to do with trying to, our brain, you know, trying to get, get us a sense of where, you know, where we're, where we're going to be that makes us feel like a place we've been before. And this, that can easily do it because we knew we would be relaxed. Why? We would take a depressant, met, a, 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 essentially a depressant drug. We would sip that, drink that, be around people, slowly get the depressant effect. So if you didn't do that, your, your mind will, will almost kind of like do that by itself. Um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing for sure. And, it, but I do think that we're, you know, um, we're going to see more and more, um, I think some of these kind of sober curious movement mocktails and, um, non-alcoholic beers and things like that. We're seeing like really, again, really, really a lot of money spent on these things. I, I can tell you, they just also, for... yeah. I was sorry, I was saying, I, could, I can tell you just from, from my own personal observations and experiences being out, you know, a couple of years ago, even as recently as a couple of years ago, if, if you wanted to go to a bar or a restaurant or something and you were out with people drinking and you didn't want to drink, you kind of had to go out of your way to order mm -hmm. something non-alcoholic uh, that might have given off the appearance that you were drinking or whatnot. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy to do. You, you, you had to flag somebody down or specifically say to a bartender, hey, make this for me. Now, more and more places straight up on their menus, whether it's their alcohol menu or just a regular menu under the alcohol section, they have sections of their menu dedicated to non-alcoholic drink options, mm -hmm. whether they are mocktails or non-alcoholic beers or, you know, whatever you, whatever place wants to call them, they are not only more socially acceptable now, I guess you could say, but many mm -hmm. places are actually embracing them. And I think that, uh, hugely the, the more places that do embrace them, I think the more, um, encouraging it will be to people as a whole to say, Hey, look, you can come out tonight and you don't necessarily have to drink if you don't want to. Uh, whereas, yeah. whereas in the past it was, you go out and all you see, are this is the liquors we have and this is the beers we have. And it's like, all right, well, if that's all you guys are advertising, I guess I'm just going to pick one of those. But now you're seeing a yeah. list of things that don't involve alcohol that sound great and taste great and look great. And you can have fun drinking it. Then, you know, maybe more people, um, even, even those that might not be struggling with alcohol, maybe pe more people will just, go out that night and say, you know what? I don't really need to drink a bunch of alcohol tonight. I can just have one of these and it tastes great. And I can just kind of relax and enjoy my night and not have to, you know, put myself in a potentially dangerous or unsafe situation at the end of the night. Yeah, no, it takes a lot of the judgment out of it. And it's, you know, I mean, I remember being places with Jenna and feeling like we almost had to like give kind of like a, a wink and a nod of like, Oh, do you have mocktails? I, you know, she can't have alcohol. Wink. She might be pregnant. Like she wasn't at the time, but it was just kind of like, she liked mocktails. And, you know, it was like, you had to give them a reason. Like what I always tell people and people are like, why don't you drink? I'm like, cause you don't have enough insurance to cover what I'm about to do to your place. <laughs> like there's a good reason not to drink. 
like you know it's it, it's like have you have you seen the avengers okay like hulk and loki that's all i'm gonna say like i am just like i will turn your place into dust and you will never get insurance for your business in this country or internationally ever again <laughs> after what i'm done with you know and then, but it's like you know so at the time you kind of needed a reason you know it's like yeah. I, I also feel you know i've i've been sober since 2005 i try to focus on saying that instead of how many years because it keeps changing in a good way you know but you know we're looking at almost 20 years now at this point and uh you know it still was awkward to like be like you know oh can we order this instead and now it's just kind of like once they saw the dollar sign it was like ah oh, oh okay well like oh this like, person isn't being cheap yeah this person isn't being cheap no. they just don't want to drink yeah they just don't want the alcohol yeah yeah it's like um yeah it's like i've been out places where somebody will get me a drink like that or something or jenna and you know like i will say just a tip for for people in recovery like me is is um i i have what's called a royal taste tester it's my joke so whenever i am at a place that is more like a bar than a restaurant and someone brings me out you know i drink diet coke or pepsi and someone is like screeching right now about, that's worse than alcohol you know but it's not i'm just letting you know maybe later on i don't know yet but i'm just letting you know where again what what well, you wouldn't like me but what i will do a lot of times is i always i always sniff my drink before i drink it and i always pass to jenna and jenna takes a sip and i do that because i don't want to deal with the shame of like listen we get in this thing of we don't want to like we don't want to mess up our our sobriety is bigger than just the liquid in the mouth it is a lifestyle it is a way of, of, of being and you know but a lot of times it can feel like you're you, you you're gonna let, let's say that they gave me the wrong drink so said, am i now on um, back to being an alcoholic it's like no no i'm not like that's not that's not how this works you know like trust me if i i will know if i am now if i order more and I say, well, might over while we're gone, you know, I might as well go for it. It's like, again, that's a different story. But I always sniff my drinks. Jenna tests them for me. God love her. I hope no one tries to poison me ever, though. I've been thinking <laughs> that the other day. I was like, oh, they're going to, my poor, my poor, wonderful wife, who is so kind and understanding. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, so if you try to poison me, just a reminder, it needs to be like at the bottom of it. <laughs> like at the bottom of the glass. So just make sure because like she's gonna sip off the top. So <laughs> you see, just make sure you weigh it down and we'll be okay and I you'll get me. So well on that note, on that unique note, we have taken up much of your time today. Not just you, Chris, <laughs> but as the audience as well. So I thank everyone for sticking around with us. Uh as long as this yeah. episode is a little bit longer than uh we normally go, but uh when I have the honor of yeah. having someone like Chris in my presence and, and your perspective, I got to take full advantage of it. And um, thank you so much for being on with us today. No, I, love uh, it. I really appreciate That's it. That's why we do this. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. So that, that'll that do it for today's show. If you liked what you heard today, be sure to, like I talked about in the beginning, be sure to subscribe to our feed. Uh, wherever you are listening to this podcast right now, if you are watching us, thank you for watching us. And uh, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. As always, we talked about a lot today, but if you or a loved one is struggling in any way, shape, or form, whether it's with your mental health, addiction, uh, substance abuse, people are out there that want to help you. Help is available to you. And even if you feel like you're alone and nobody's out there for you, there is somebody out there that wants to, to help you. I promise you that. If you are looking to try to find options in your area to get the help that you need, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has a great resource page. Um, they also have a helpline available. Um, the number is at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to go ahead and call them, it's 1-800-662-4357, uh, or you can visit their online program locator by visiting findtreatment.samsa.gov. That's findtreatment.samsa. It's spelled S-A-M-H-S-A.gov. Once again, if you're watching us, that is on the bottom of your screen right now. If not, if you're listening to us, uh, when, when, you, when you're at a spot where you can safely check them out, <laughs> Uh, obviously, we don't want anyone texting and driving, but uh, if you are in an area where it's safe for you to do so, go ahead and uh, check them out if you need any help. Uh, that is it for me today. I am your host, Dan Hauser. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you all next week. Have a good week, everyone.